This is BJ Mendelssohn, and BJ wants your money. Don't worry, he's not asking for a lot. Just $5. Why? Because he has a goal. BJ wants to make everyone on the planet laugh. How? By giving his comics, podcasts, and newsletters away for free. But he can't do that without your support. So what are you waiting for? Give BJ $5 today and help give the world something to laugh at. Hello, everyone. My name is BJ Mendelson, and we are taping another edition of Weibo.tv. And joining to me, joining me today, I can't talk. I just had two hours straight of meetings. I went right into my interview here with Stephen. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, so I'll let you pick where where to start. Can you tell us what you're currently working on? Yeah. So my name is Stephen Renderos, and I'm the executive director at a national organization called Media Justice, and uh, what I've been working on. So recently, uh, I joined the Real Facebook Oversight Board, um, which is made up of a group of experts, uh, academics, activists, and tech leaders who are working for accountability and oversight at Facebook. Um, it was in part formed prior to the 2020 elections because many of us feared that in the years since the previous election, Facebook had not really done enough to address this information. And some of that pressure, you know, led to Facebook taking some steps to change what news people saw, you know, leading up to and in the days following the latest presidential election. Um, but then they quickly reverted, you know, the fastest growing Facebook groups after the November 2020 elections were the stop the steal groups, you know, the, the groups that promoted the idea that the election was, you know, had been stolen. And that's in part how the January 6th insurrection actually came together, you know, it was aided very explicitly by Facebook's algorithms, which, you know, have valued, you know, likes and clicks above all else. And, you know, and I think that's why the real Facebook oversight board is really concerned right now that today in 2022, Facebook continues to put democracies at risk in the US and in countries like India, Brazil, the Philippines, you know, practically any country that's undergoing an election now actually has to contend with the spread of mis and disinformation because, you know, Facebook has uh, failed to keep its users safe. And, you know, today extremist content from white nationalists continues to spread on the platform, disinformation, particularly in languages that are other than English, you know, run rampant. Facebook has only partially implemented some of the recommendations that emerged from an independent civil rights audit from a couple of years ago. Uh, and today, Black users and other users representing uh, marginalized communities, you know, still face harassment, still see their posts and accounts routinely suspended for violating opaque community standards and all the while, you know, far right extremist content, COVID mis and disinformation, QAnon conspiracy theories continue to thrive on the platform. Now, how did you, I'm curious, like what your journey was to discovering this, this issue with Facebook and then joining the board. For me, you know, I wrote social media is bullshit back in 2012. And so I was mm. kind of like early in saying, you know, the platform is not being policed and then there's a lot of ways to abuse it. And, you know, and then we had the discovery later on of what Russia was doing on the platform starting in about 2012 and probably going on into today. So, but, but I'd like to learn more about, about your journey to into discovery and then taking action about what Facebook is doing. Yeah, I mean, I came in a little after you, although I was an early adopter of Facebook. I remember joining Facebook uh, back in college, you know, back when it was the facebook.com, um, you know, but I, I really came into organizing to try to change Facebook, uh, it's in 2015 and, you know, my, my entry point into it was, um, the killing of Corinne Gaines by the Baltimore County police. You know, she was a black woman who was dealing with a confrontation with police. Um, and she was actually trying to live stream her kind of interaction with police uh, via the Instagram uh, live feature back then. Um, and she was also routinely posting updates to her Facebook page. Um, and uh, the Baltimore County Police uh, Department made a request of Facebook to take down her accounts um, and you know, to which they complied and to which Facebook complied. And shortly thereafter, the Baltimore County police like rushed into her apartment and shot and killed her. And this was in front of her, um, I think like six-year-old son. Um, you know, and, and it was a, it was a wake up call for me. Um, 
to realize that this platform, which at least for me back in 2004, 2005, whenever I joined had been this kind of, you know, interesting space for social connection, um, had become a different kind of platform that could lead to real world harms for people. And, you know, once I started going down that path, um, you know, I was already working at media justice back then. And we were talking to black activists who were involved in at that time, you know, the movement um, that was emerging around black lives matter, the hashtag, uh, who kept telling us, like, we keep running into this issue where anytime we tried to post a, you know, uh, an article or a live stream of a protest that we're at for police violence, our content gets routinely taken down. Um, so we started working, I think like a lot of people on the real Facebook oversight board, I went through the same trajectory, which is like, you start working with the company, hoping and negotiating in good faith to try to make some change. And, um, and then finding yourself disappointed as you get kind of strung along and, um, and have and see some like marginal shifts in policies be then later completely undermined by, you know, uh, decisions higher up the, the leadership chain. Um, so that was my experience for many years. And then I kind of got tired of it. So we pulled back from trying to make change happen at Facebook and, and as an organization have been focusing more on the, um, you know, institutional changes we can make to policy. And, and that's when, you know, joining the real Facebook oversight board became a possibility for me because this is a group that is, uh, pretty much invested in, in wanting to, um, you know, wanting to to find that that real that real independent oversight, the the real regulation, and fighting for those things. So I'm excited to be a part of this body for that reason. Tell me a little bit about media justice for people that that aren't familiar with the organization behind uh, the real Facebook oversight board's Twitter account. Yeah, so uh, media justice is a national racial justice organization. We've been around for um, a little over ten years, and um, you know, we uh, were founded um, with a vision, uh, uh, this vision that we believe of wanting to live in a world where everyone is connected, represented, and free. Um, you know, so we we are very kind of rooted in this kind of human rights and civil rights tradition here in the United States, and and we we feel like you actually can't bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice. To paraphrase um, Dr. King unless oppressed people can control the tools that shape uh, the values, that shape values and morality in our society. And in the 21st century, that actually means greater agency over media and technology. You know, that means a model that doesn't allow for a handful of companies to control our entire experience online. And uh, which is why over the years we've worked on you know, fighting back against the consolidation of our media system. We've fought for net neutrality rules, um, which we were able to win in 2015 and then lost under Trump, um, you know, to protect um, people's like online expression. Um, we have fought against the use of surveillance technology in the context of policing and the use of technology in the criminal legal system. Um, you know, so that's that's a little bit of our, our our background, and so we do that through organizing, advocacy campaigns, and then uh, we also do that by trying to build uh, a larger network of you know organizations that are racial justice, media, and arts organizations that collectively are trying to come together and make that change. And people watching this, if they if they want to get involved, if they want to push for change or advocate for change on Facebook and all its different platforms, what would you say to them? What would you suggest they they do first? Yeah, I mean, definitely follow groups like us. I think we we're fortunate that, um, you know, we don't believe that us alone can make this change, but um, we work in coalition with a lot of other organizations that 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 you know that are working towards that change. So follow groups like Media Justice, um, follow the Real Facebook Oversight Board. Um, we're a part of other coalitions like the Change the Terms Coalition, the Disinfo Defense League. You know, all groups that are trying to tackle the bevy of issues that exist um, online today. So really, you know, connect with those organizations and get involved to, to the extent that you can, um, you know, in supporting them and getting directly involved if you want to. I think, um, I definitely think that this is an inflection point um, around the future 
um, of technology and, and what role and, and who technology ends up serving. And, you know, we live in an ecosystem right now that is largely controlled by a handful of companies that curate our entire experience online. Um, and, you know, I deeply believe that I think collectively with, I'm an organizer, so I believe in people power. I believe that organized people can make a difference. And so um, I would definitely encourage people to get involved with any of those organizations. What would you say the, what is the ideal conclusion to all the advocacy? Is it Facebook being broken up? Is it Facebook um, having an actual oversight board that's like a government oversight board? Or maybe it's just something completely different. I would love to hear what, like what that goal is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, um, I come from, you know, I was raised uh, in Los Angeles, uh, by immigrant parents. Uh, my, my family's from El Salvador, uh, you know, and I was born in the eighties, came up in, in a California that was staunchly anti-immigrant. And so I, I grew up, you know, seeing a lot of like terrible representations of immigrants. And I, and I uh, part of the reason I kind of was drawn to being a media maker myself, you know, which outside of being <laughs> the executive director at this organization, I do, I do create content myself. Um, it's because I definitely felt like there's real power in being able to control your own story. Um, and, you know, and I think as I think about the future of where we need to go, we need a future in which we have agency to, to control the media and technology that shape our lives. And, you know, we've been on this really long trajectory around technology being a tool that really serves the interests of those in power, you know, and I think as far back as like, there's this anecdote with, you know, folks might not know this about Thomas Jefferson, but he was also an inventor, you know, he's credited with inventing this technology called uh, the dumb waiter. Um, and some folks might know, have seen that, like if you check out a home that's, you know, uh, a lot older on the East coast and it was a technology that he developed because he didn't want his guests coming over for dinner parties to interact with the help for people to, to know that he had slaves that owned slaves, um, you know, that had, he had enslaved folks. And, you know, that's, I think, been the function of technology for many years. It's been this tool to really serve the interest of others and also to create a separation between those that are being marginalized and oppressed and those that are in power. Um, and, and that's why I think today is this inflection point. We're in a moment where I think we can shift the balance of power. Um, and so to me, that future looks like, um, you know, whether it includes platforms like Facebook or Facebook itself or Meta or whatever it's trying to call itself these days, um, that who gets to govern it is the people that make up its community. Um, so, you know, I don't know exactly you know, if Facebook in its current iteration exists in that future for me. Um, I do think that the pathway to get there means, you know, greater, compelling greater transparency, compelling greater control, oversight um, through policy, uh, and, you know, and really giving people um, insights into how this company functions, because that's one thing that I think Facebook has been very strategic at doing. It's always hiding the ball of how it's structured and, and how it makes its decisions and, um, you know, bringing it to, to the light of day. I wonder if given a choice, uh, how, you know, how would people pick today? And, and I think about myself in 2004, would I choose to be a part of this platform today, knowing everything that I know now, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the answer is likely no. I mean, I think a lot about that with MySpace because I think we're about the same age. And so I remember the, yeah. the, the choice between the two and you had on one side a company that was owned by Rupert Murdoch that was evil. Uh, and the only thing they ever did that was profitable was selling hand cream. That's a true story. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's from Julia, Julia Ang when uh, she, she wrote a book about MySpace. And the only division that was ever profitable of the company was the division that Fox bought uh, mm -hmm. was selling hand cream. And then on the other side, you had what was perceived to be this college student, right? This, this cool college kid opening a place for other college kids to hang out, uh, not realizing what the, what the truth was. And so that I'm glad you mentioned because it it's something I think people our age or Xennials or whatever you want to call us, you know, we now think about like we've contributed to this without yeah. necessarily knowing 
what the ramifications would be and then and wrapping our hands around that. I have to ask you with that. So like these are all very heavy topics. Like, is, so is there anything that you do to kind of not relax, but just to, to help organize and clarify and, and think about these things in a way that doesn't, it doesn't become overwhelming? Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, I go on walks a lot, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, like as I was mentioning, I'm a, I make media on the side. Um, so I produce a podcast with a friend of mine, um, Brandy Collins Dexter, who coincidentally, um, for many years, she worked at, as a campaign director at Color of Change, um, a national kind of racial justice organization that, and we collaborated a lot on taking on Facebook over the years. Um, but she's a good friend of mine. Uh, and we have a podcast called Bring Receipts, where where we debate um, our both of our unpopular opinions about pop culture. Um, so uh, our first season is up, and we like focused on the '80s because we were both born in the '80s. Uh, so a lot of bad, <laughs> a lot of bad takes. <laughs> um, like I was, I was arguing that Sylvester Stallone should have won an Oscar for his performance in Rambo: First Blood, but um, which of course I lost that debate. But actually, now <laughs> spoiler alert, I lost that debate. But um, but yeah, so I do stuff like that, which is helpful because I think going back um, in that podcast, we, you know, we're both very politically minded. And so we, we like to think about culture, not just through the lens of like, you know, what was happening in that moment, but really like the political context of that moment, the, the context for oppressed people in that moment. And so, you know, we do, we do kind of cover a range of topics, um, as we, as we also engage in very silly debates. So that's part of what I do, I think, to unwind. Uh, and I actually, I, I agree with you. I think that Sylvester Stallone should have won the Academy <laughs> Award for Rambo first, but it's a great film. Um, tell me what, if you had to pick an episode, would, would that be the episode that you would want to tell people about? The one after that is uh, episode um, where uh, my colleague Brandy argues that uh, Marvin Gaye's uh, rendition of the Star Spangled Banner um, at the 1983 All-Star Game, which was in Los Angeles at the Great Western Forum. I'm a Lakers fan. That's where I grew up. Um, but she she believes that that's the only rendition that we should hear of that, of that anthem. Uh, it's a great episode because we talk about uh, we do a deep dive on Marvin Gaye's kind of history, his uh, where his anti-war stance really came from. You know, it's kind of fueled by you know people think of what's going on as like this really like incredible um, anti-war album, like in the peak of Vietnam, and and a lot of it was rooted in his his brother's experience having gone to Vietnam. Um, so we we cover that, and um, I think it's a great episode. It's also my colleague Brandy's father um, had passed away the year before. And, and, um, so she, she talks a lot about kind of processing grief, um, and through the life of Marvin Gaye, who had a lot of parallels to her father. So that's a great episode, I think, to start with. Nice. Now, let me ask you, what would you say to content creators who, who kind of have this dilemma, right? Uh, if you put out a podcast, you want people to know about it and you're stuck having to use these platforms that are essentially evil in, in, mm -hmm. in some respects. And so how do you, how do you wrap your head around that, like in terms of promoting the podcast? Yeah, I mean, you know, we live in contradiction every day, um, and you know, I, I would consider myself someone who is who values, um, who holds values that are anti-capitalist, but I have to navigate a capitalist system every day. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it's interesting. I was I was just talking to a friend about this yesterday about. Um, you know, we, we, we text each other about music and I was telling him that there's this artist, um, Yaritza Isu Esencia, uh, which is, a she's an artist who, with a little band, um, with this kind of really relatively unknown genre called Corridos Tumbados, uh, which is like a relatively new genre that's really emerging and with really young Mexican Americans here in the United States, um, who kind of follow in the tradition of corridos, but then blend in kind of hip hop elements and, um, and other things. And, you know, she has blown up primarily because of TikTok um, and uh, actually draws her inspiration, her creative process. Uh, you know, that song, one song that really blew her up was inspired by a TikTok video that she saw. Um, you know, and so it reminds me of like the SoundCloud rappers from a few years ago that then, you know, like the Post Malones of the world who, you know, were able to achieve some modicum of like 
wide visibility and then, you know, get, get mainstreamed. I think this is a tension that we have with this infrastructure that we call the internet, which is what does, which does allow for kind of two way communications. And that's that, you know, capitalism is advancing and trying to find ways to commodify everything. And I think we saw that with, with Facebook going from like a space of like connection to a space that was driven by, um, likes and shares. And obviously the content that outrages us is the stuff that's going to drive that engagement. Um, and that's why they leaned into that. And, um, and so, you know, I've stepped back from those platforms, um, and there's always new ones popping up and, you know, I think TikTok is kind of the latest horizon that I think will, is already getting like immensely commodified as it is. And, you know, I expect that something else will emerge. And, um, I think that's just a tension and contradiction that we're in. So I leverage it to the extent that I can. I mean, I hate Spotify, but I can't, I can't not distribute to Spotify, um, if I'm trying to distribute a podcast. So, yeah. I forget who said it, but, um, they were making the point that they use the tools of the machine against itself. Yeah. And no, that's, sure. it was a band and they were saying, well, why'd you sign up a record label? And that was, that was the response. Um, what, what advice did you get in your life that, that you found was really helpful and inspiring in, in kind of pushing you in the direction that you've gone in? Yeah, I had a organizing mentor, um, after college when I started, um, doing community organizing as a actual career path. And, um, he, he used to talk a lot about power. His name was Salvador Miranda. Um, and, uh, he said that you have to act yourself into a new way of thinking. Um, and for me as an organizer, someone who, you know, wanted to make change in the world. And a lot of that was just rooted in my experience growing up as, uh, as a child of immigrants, watching my mom, you know, work as a, as a garment factory worker for, uh, for years, you know, um, making minimum wage. I, in fact, like my first job, um, in high school at a sporting goods store, I was making more an hour than she had ever made, you know, in, in all her years and working. And, you know, I think about, that's the change I, I want to drive in the world is to make her life better. You know, it's a, a big supreme motivation for me, but I didn't really understand how, um, and organizing came, came apart, you know, came, a, came my way after college. And, um, and one of the things I think I learned is in becoming an organizer is what it takes to build power and, and acting ourselves into a new way of thinking is critical to that because power is really just the ability to act. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that was supremely helpful for me. And it's, uh, about embodying a certain, um, you know, embodying the change that we want in the world. And, and I think I've taken that to heart, particularly as I've become an executive director the last couple of years, um, and thinking about what do I want my leadership to look like and how should it be structured? And, uh, I've been thinking a lot about how we can, you know, as we're fighting for justice as an organization that fights for justice, how can we create that justice even within, the institutions that we're in, you know, how can we start to feel some of that change now? So, um, acting yourself into a new way of thinking, I think is one that's really stuck with me. Uh, I got my two last questions. I ask everybody. The, the first is in your case, you come across a lot of organizers who maybe haven't gotten the attention they deserve for the work. Is there anyone that comes to mind that you really want to, or any organization that comes to mind that you really want to put a spotlight on? Yeah, there's so many. Um, you know, there's an organization that um, is a member of our network that has um, since about 2012 been fighting for the abolition of technology, um, tech surveillance technology um, in policing. Uh, that's an organization out in Los Angeles called the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Um, you know, I think they've been immensely influential in the wider field of groups that have, you know, worked on these issues of like tech, um, you know, tech justice and, and really pulled us towards a more radical vision. Um, and, uh, so shout outs to Hamid Khan, who is one of their organizers who has been an incredibly influential figure for me in that respect, um, and stop LAPD spying coalition, which is, you know, a, a group led by, um, you know, folks who are at the margins. I mean, they're literally based in 
the Skid Row neighborhood of Los Angeles, a place where when you talk about surveillance, that is the epicenter. You know, it happens at every form, at every institution. So that's an organization I think deserves more attention. What's one question you wish I'd asked that I didn't? Where can you find my podcast? Uh, oh, that was uh, that was coming up last. That's always the last one. <laughs> no, I mean this oh, is okay. uh, this is I, there isn't necessarily a, a question. I guess um, I guess for me, um, yeah, it's just exciting to to get to talk about these issues. So really, really grateful. Yeah, I would love it if you would be willing to come back. Um, you know, maybe when we get closer to the election. Absolutely. Um, I think that would be very important for people to hear. Um, but yeah, where where can we find the podcast? Where can we find you? Where can we find the uh, the real Facebook oversight board? Yes, yeah, so I'll do a plug for for my podcast. The season two of it, of which is coming out soon. It's coming out probably uh, sometime in May. It's it's focused on the '90s, which will be a lot of fun. Because uh, just to preview one of the debates I'm most excited about, uh, we debate the best new metal band, you know, Limp Bizkit versus Corn. Um, Interesting. It, it, it's it's a really good debate. I'm really excited for folks to listen to that. I've also got a a different project um, that I should plug that's coming out on May 1st. Um, it's called Revolutionary Spirits. It's a podcast I'm producing. I'm not on it, um, but I'm just producing it um, for a couple friends. And it's focused on, that first season is focused on the life of a pretty famous Mexican revolutionary, Francisco Madero. Um, and it retells his life um, in a way, you know, and offers like a very unconventional take on his life because it focuses on his uh, his practice of spiritism, which was a kind of a religious or spiritual practice in the early kind of 20th century that was pretty popular, where people f- believed that they could channel spirits themselves. Um, so this this uh, this person who went on to become Mexico's first like democratically elected leader uh, in the 20th century, uh, channeled ghosts. And one of those ghosts was his baby brother. And, and his baby brother gave him some wonderful advice about how to be an apostle of democracy. Uh, and that one comes out May 1st and folks, you know, should, should check it out. Um, you can subscribe to it now and, and, uh, check out the trailer. It sounds, it sounds like an amazing show. Like that's, I am sold on that description alone. Like it's cool. So, I mean, so we like, talk about masculinity, which is very interesting, and and how Madero kind of projected masculinity, particularly in a time period uh, of a lot of toxic masculinity. And so, I think one of the cool things that the hosts of the show do is kind of draw those parallels between the toxic masculinity of of you know it, within the Mexican Revolution and and how we see that kind of in the contemporary U.S. today. That's fascinating. I I love it. Um, thank you so much for for joining me, for taking the time. Um, I will make sure to let you know when this go li- goes live. Just hang out for one second to just make sure everything records and uh, we'll leave goodbye to anyone who might be watching on the live stream.